ignite your passion for the eternal word while searching for ancient tested answers to today's questions. Delve into the mysteries of the Bible to discover ancient Jewish wisdom with Rabbi Daniel Lapin. Now, here is today's program. Hi, I'm so glad that you've invited us to spend a little time in your home. Rabbi Daniel Lapin, my husband, I'm Susan Lapin, and we love visiting you. But of course, we have our own home, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. Actually, not where we live right now, but where we lived for many, many years. We lived on a lovely cul-de-sac, and about three doors down, I'm thinking of Sandy's family, so I think they were three doors down from us, we had a neighbor who grew the most magnificent fruits and vegetables in her backyard. She grew, I don't even know, uh, but they had apples and strawberries and all sorts of things. And you know what? It was amazing. Just a couple of hundred yards down the block in our house, we must have had a different climate and a different soil because we just did not grow the same type of things. Actually, we grew nothing. Our backyard, I would have to say, rather than being this cornucopia of produce, was more a cornucopia of mess. That's what I would say. We just, we just, we just didn't have enough topsoil, really. <laughs> well, as I say, I think it was a different climate down the block from, from that because okay, she just so grew fine. these... Okay, so fine. We don't have green thumbs. <laughs> she grew this gorgeous stuff. And you know what? I sometimes thought of going over and saying, you know, you just have such beautiful produce, and look, we don't. And don't you want to be a godly person? Don't you want to be a loving neighbor? Don't you think that you should share half of what you have? Look, you have so much. We have so little, nothing actually. Don't you think you should share with us? Because look at this produce. God has blessed you with this. Surely you want to be a godly person and you would like to share with us. Because God hasn't blessed us with the equivalent produce. What do you think? Fortunately, you didn't do that. I didn't, you know, I thought about it, but I was busy. <laughs> Um, and it's not, not just the produce, I mean, it, it was embarrassing, really, because Marsha next door um, had flowers. Oh, yeah, gorgeous flowers. gorgeous flowers. Gorgeous flowers, all, almost year-round, right? And, well, all I can say is that, that our garden provided joyful noise and <laughs> rambunctious enthusiasm on the part of, of, of seven children who, who, who you know... And we had the best climbing rope on the street. We had the best climbing the rope. Tree, from the tree. Uh, we yeah. had a tree house. So maybe we didn't have the, the flowers and the produce, but our garden, still our yard, served its purpose. It also served as grazing for a llama, don't That's forget. That's right, it did for a so, while. Um, but even so, wouldn't it have been nice of the neighbors to just say, look, you have nothing, I have so much, let me bring you all, half of what I have. It, well, in all fairness, they occasionally did uh, bring us things. some That's true. Uh, tomatoes. We had wonderful were, neighbors. The we, truth is we had wonderful neighbors. But I think the, the point you're trying to make is, uh, is really the, the idea of ownership. And, and I, I'll tackle it from a slightly different point of view. And I'm, I'm going to tackle it from the point of view of saying that uh, the idea of individuals owning their land and individuals owning their stuff is counterintuitive provided you believe in a godless reality. Because in a godless reality, the world came into being somehow, it's not important how, and life came to be somehow, it's not important how. But the point is that life is not meaningful. Life of human beings and life of animals is just part of the same spectrum. And I would ask you, do you see ownership in the animal kingdom? Can you think of a single animal of a single species that tends to regard things in terms of ownership? No, there are territorial rights, of course. A, a dog doesn't want another dog taking a bone that it has, but it doesn't think it owns that bone uh, because a day or two later it's ignored it, it's forgotten, it's finished. And, and so it is whether it's a beaver or a, uh, a cow or a camel or a kangaroo or a cat, there isn't such a thing as ownership. What's more, in primitive cultures that never had any contact with God's manual for human existence, well, they never had ownership either. You go back to uh, 
the early days of, of Native American Indians on, in North America, whether in Canada or in uh, what is now the United States or in Central America or South America, there was no ownership per se. Uh, there was people, people moved. I mean, think of the uh, American Indians. They traveled, uh, they'd come to a new place. There was no such idea of owning land. Where would they get it from? It's not part of the natural world. No animal thinks of ownership. Right? Lions wander the, the African felt. They don't set up shop in a place, build a fence and say, this is our place. It's not known. And, um, and, and the, the, this idea that human beings should own their things, and what's more, that God actually wants ownership, is a uniquely biblical perspective on reality. So much so that when societies are established on an anti-godly basis and societies are structured in the absence of God, they also obliterate private ownership. Have you noticed? Under socialist or communist regimes, what do you find? You don't get private ownership. Can I add something? Please. Sometimes it is godly people, and, and we all can have a tendency to this to think, well, that was good for them, and God meant that for them, but I'm so much smarter, so now I know differently. The early pilgrims, who were extremely godly people, but when they came off the Mayflower, Ooh, yes, they were point. facing having to structure a new society, and they made a decision that there should be shared distribution of outcome. In other words, they knew it was going to be a struggle. This wasn't that everybody was now coming in and it was going to be easy. And so they, they set up their society on the basis of we all work and then we will equally divide. And it would almost destroyed the colony after one year when it was a disaster. People died of salvation. They gave up on that and yeah. they went back to God's plan of ownership. So sometimes even godly people... William Bradford in, the, in his history of the Plymouth Plantation describes mm -hmm. how they said, no, we're going to have to go back to, <laughs> to the biblical perspective of people owning their land to cultivate. And he said, this unleashed a tornado of creativity they'd never seen before because people work differently when it's their land than they do when they so were I just want to make the point else. that godly people, which we try to be, we, we, we can still all make, make mistakes. mistakes. We can all make mistakes. Um, by the way, the, the modern state of Israel was founded in, in 1948, but Jews started coming back and rebuilding from the beginning of the 1900s, late 1800s. And um, what form of social structure did they come up with? A kibbutz. Now, the kibbutz, uh, in, its, in its ultimate sense, has been entirely discredited today because it doesn't work. But for decades, uh, they operated on the Soviet model where everything is communal and there is no private ownership of everything. Well, today it's becoming realized that that just doesn't work because that's not how God designed his system. To be fair, just historically, those people really were trying to replace God with the state of Israel. There was a, the early founders of the yeah, state of Israel were. would not for the most part godly people. They were saying they were, they were thinking of Judaism as a nationality. And so they, this was, they, they came, many of them, from so, the Soviet Union, and so they brought the ideas of the Soviet Union with them. And the truth is that um, when you see societies declining and winding down, it's a pretty good proof that they're doing something wrong, that they're not following the biblical blueprint for success. That's is, what we have. Is there a specific, I mean, there are so many. This, the truth is that God caring about and, and preferring ownership, individual ownership, is really throughout Scripture. But oh, is there it's a, obvious, a specific yes. I mean, you know, you let's put it this way. If there was not private ownership of wealth, uh, the whole law of giving charity... You're right, doesn't exist. ...is meaningless because how can you give charity if you don't own anything? So it's perfectly obvious. But uh, I'll tell you one of my favorite ones is from the uh, prophet Micah. And uh, in the, the book of Micah, uh, chapter 4... Verse 3, listen to this. God will judge between many people and will settle the arguments of mighty nations from far away. Famous phrase, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not lift nation against nation. Nation will not lift sword against nation. And nor will they learn war anymore. An idyllic time. 
This is beautiful. This is what we aim for, how great this will be. And by the way, when that happens, and you might have thought that at that time we'll finally do away with private ownership and everybody will own everything together, we'll all share everything. God says, oh no. You know what's going to happen in that time? Continuing, they will sit, every man under his vine and every man under his fig tree, Nobody to make them afraid. It didn't say that every man will sit under any old vine and every man will sit under, oh, any old fig tree. No, they will sit under his fig tree and he will sit under his vine. In other words, a very emphatic note by the prophet Micah that in an ideal environment, everybody has his own. He's got his own land. He's got his own fig tree. He's got his own house. He's got his own vine. You know, there was something that just jumped out to me when you read that as well. It doesn't say, do you remember John Lennon's song, Imagine? Imagine oh, a world without, yes. you know, uh, it's really a peon to atheism it's, and the socialistic vision. It doesn't say nations will cease to exist. And that'll be the idyllic time. It says nation sh will not lift sword against nation. Not that we will eradicate nationhood and yes. we'll all be one happy world together. In other words, quite this, right. this uh, ideal John Lennon's time. song was imagine a world with no borders right. and no nationalities and everybody. Yeah, right. So this exactly. idyllic time that God is painting to us has private ownership and it does have nationalities, but it is each nation being content and happy and productive in its own space, not yes. needing to go out and attack other nations and their space. So what's, what's so important about this is that God's plan for human interaction is not, oh, I want you all my children to arrive at a point where you all share everything. So we learn a lesson from that, by the way, and that um, we never give our children a gift for all of you. I shouldn't say never. Yeah, every, now and then, every now and then there have been occasions. But by <laughs> and large, what we do is we always give gifts to a specific child in the hope, please share them. We want you, and sometimes we'll give them games. And yes, it's yours. We expect you to be responsible for it. We expect you to look after it. But... Um, it's something you can't really use by yourself. You need other people as gay. The instructions say a game for between four and six players. Well, luckily you've got uh, six siblings, so go ahead. But always emphasizing the, the idea of ownership because that is part of God's plan. For instance, one of the, uh, the rules, it's really rather remarkable. Imagine that uh, you're walking down the road and you see something that someone obviously lost. Uh, you know, it's got his name on it, or you recognize it, as you've seen it uh, with him before. Maybe it's a watch, and you've admired it on his wrist, and now you see it lying. And you think to yourself, oh, look, John's lost his watch. And you continue hurrying off to the railway station to catch your train to work. Not allowed to do that. You say, what do you mean? I, I, I can ignore something. Aren't I allowed to ignore something? No, you can't ignore something, not if it involves ownerless property. I just want to extend on that because when you said John lost his watch, well, that's when I see something and I actually know who it belongs to. But God goes beyond that. And God says, let's, you see, look, if you see a, a, a dollar bill, and then if you don't see this, you know, that the, if you see it falling out of someone's pocket or someone's purse, then you must call them and give it back to them. But if you just see a dollar bill lying around, there's no way for anyone to identify that. But if you see a watch, you must go over and pick it up, for example. And maybe there's a clue. Maybe there's an inscription in it. You, may, you have to go over even if you don't know who it belongs to. You don't recognize it and say, oh, that's John's. And you actually, there is an obligation to, to put up a note in the local supermarket found a watch at this location if you can identify it if it has an identify number, that's yes. right in other words our obligation is to um to do something to prevent ownerlessness economists speak of something called the tragedy of the commons and this is something that i think everyone recognizes which is when you declare a piece of land as belonging to everybody the end result is it belongs to nobody People bring their cattle to graze there, 
and they'll graze it until there's nothing but sand left, which the wind and the rain will erode, and it'll become a wasteland. Uh, nobody owns it, therefore nobody looks after it. Today, we kind of try and bypass that by saying, well, the government owns it, the government will take care of it. But no government will ever take care of anything as well as a human being will look after it if it's his. And so it's almost as if, not almost as if, God despises ownerlessness and he expects us to be his partners and to make sure that if we uncover something which is, owner, which is separated from its owner, well, instead of me talking, why don't I let God talk directly? Let's go to the book of Exodus. And uh, book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 4. If you encounter an ox of your enemy or your enemy's donkey, wandering, obviously lost, you shall return it to your enemy. Wow, this is very interesting. Doesn't say your friend. Doesn't say your brother. It says your enemy. So important is this idea that God wants us to own things. That if even my enemy has been separated from his property, as God's partner, I am obliged to return it. This is an amazing thing. Go to Exodus chapter 23, verse 4. Read it. And then when you've done that, go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, and uh, in Deuteronomy chapter, where are we looking? Verse 1. I, I'll go with that. Chapter 22, verse 1, Deuteronomy. Listen to this. You shall not see the ox of your brother or his sheep or goat abandoned, alone, and just ignore them. No, you shall surely return them to your brother. <clears throat> Wait, if, this, oh, you're going on? Sorry. No, just that. And even if you don't know exactly who it belongs to, it's, you know, your brother used generically, you got to go and find him. Find out who it but is. But I don't understand because it would seem that if you, you know, there's a concept in learning Bible where it's something called in Hebrew kal vachomer. If it says that you have to, um, that a six, the, the, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I'm giving you the example. A room, um, a six foot person is able to walk through the doorway easily. It's a very tall doorway. You don't have to go then and say, oh, and also a four foot eight person can walk through. In other words, if, it's, if you're making the point that the doorway is high enough for a six foot person to walk through, we're, we can kind of assume that anyone under six foot can walk through that as well. Well, if it told us in Exodus that we have the obligation to return lost property even, to our enemy. Even to our enemy. Then why do I have obviously. to be told that I have to return it to my friend? I would say, well, duh, of course I'm going to return it to someone I like. Maybe, you know, God's telling me, look, sorry, there is such a thing as enmity and there are certain things you, you do for those closer to you and not for those further away. Yeah. But when it comes to lost property, you have the obligation to return see, lost property. If, if human beings were writing this book, uh, it's quite possible, I think, that I would have put the brother story before the strangers or your enemy ah, story. Saying, you know, start off by saying, by the way, if your brother lost, uh, you know, somebody close to you, your friend or your whatever it is, lost something, you've got an obligation to get it back to him. And then in Deuteronomy, I could have said, and by the way, don't think this rule applies just to your brother, even your enemy. But that's not how God did it. God has enemy first. And once he did enemy first, do we really have to be told You'd to do thought, this for the brother and for your you friend? Thought, well, I mean, okay, fine. Once you tell me I've, I've got to do it even for my enemy, it's pretty obvious that I've got to do it for my brother as well. Why does it need to be stated? It must be that there are some lessons for us to draw from this. Lesson number one. You might have thought that people, if we can eliminate private property, like the communists say, like the socialists say, like John Lennon said, before he had a re... By the way, it's, it's said that John Lennon had a re... I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, had a, had a sort of change of mind and, and, um, and did not stick with this belief that he put out in that disgusting song, Imagine. But, um, but you might have imagined that if we could just do away with private property, oh, everyone would be so friendly and they'd all be nice and they'd all be close. We just got to change human nature and get rid of all that stuff. The truth is that if you want peace among people and you want cooperation and collaboration among people, just as God wants among all of us, his children, let everybody own his own thing. There's actually a, a saying in, a, in a good fences make good neighbors. 
knowing the demarcation of your property and my property makes us good neighbors, not, well, who cares? <laughs> yeah, and that there's no, yeah, uh, you know, there's no borders. Yours, no mine, it ours. Doesn't, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't work like that at all. So, so there we've got uh, this first idea, and that is that um, here's a way to go from brother to friend. Brother, you know, why does Exodus talk of... From enemy to friend. From, why does Exodus talk about enemy in Deuteronomy speaks about friend? Because you can change enemies into friends by respecting one another's property. That's a really important point. That peace among people, closeness and friendship is protected when we defend property rights, the rights of people to own things. And one of the marks of a deteriorating society is when a culture or a country or a nation or a society begins to get increasingly hostile towards private property. When you notice a government speaking increasingly negatively about people, quote, rich people, no definition of rich, but uh, just rich people, meaning people who've actually acquired some property, those people are bad, well, that is a very clear sign of a nation where brothers are going to be turned into enemies. I say it's not, it's not yeah, necessarily... Did you hear? Mm, I have something to say. But did you hear what I just yeah. said? Brothers well, get turned into enemies. It's where God's way enemies God's get way turned enemies into brothers. Are turned into I was going to say, it's not, it's not only speaking of bad, but with the ideas, as with my example of our neighbor who grew that beautiful produce, that it, wouldn't it be fair, and we, the government, be, will be the ones to do it, we will take from those who have and give to those who don't have, and that will lead to a better society. That will lead people to... Be, now, Charity, charity, that's a personal obligation that if I believe in God, I believe I don't have a choice. Charity isn't my choice. When I earn a certain amount of money, God didn't say, and if you would like to be a good person, you should give and share it with those who are poorer than you. That's right. my personal, that's an obligation. I don't have the right to all that God gives me because God has said some of that doesn't belong to you, some of that belongs to my children who have less than you. When the government does it, that isn't the government saying, this is how I want you because I am the Lord your God, your government, and that's how I want. They're saying, we're gonna take it from you, no matter what you want. We're gonna take it from you and it's not your choice. So we got three lessons from this very interesting thing, which is that if me or most probably Almost any other human being were, were going to write this, we would have started off with brother. Um, or we would have just said enemy. Like, uh, like Exodus says, if your enemy's property is lost, you must return it to him and leave it there. You don't have to tell me brother, because if I've got to do it for my enemy, obviously I've got to do it for my brother. But since both appear, I would have said, well, let's put brother first, because that's more natural and more important. And then tell me, and by the way, this rule extends not only to the people you know and love, but even to your enemies. Okay, great. The fact that it's the other way around, first enemies and then brothers, you've got to give back everybody's property, tells us three things. Number one, that God prefers a society in which everybody owns things, that there's not ownerlessness out there. And that we don't have government owning stuff, but individuals own things. That's number one. Number two, that we can convert an enemy into a friend by protecting property rights, by making sure that people are encouraged to own, not live in government housing. You're not doing anybody any favor by doing that. Encourage people to be able to have their own houses. Now you're talking. That way they become independent. And relationships between independent people are much stronger and much healthier and much more wholesome and much warmer than between dependent people. And the third thing is that we are expected to overcome our natures. The truth is, while I love doing a favor to my brother and to my friends, I love that. How about doing a favor for an enemy? That's a lot harder. Don't follow your instincts. My instincts are, who cares? Serves him right. I'm happy he's lost his stuff. Not allowed to do that. It is important to overcome our ignoble and baser instincts, the things that we tend to do because that's how we feel. We say, no, we don't act in accordance with how we feel. 
We act in accordance with what God expects us to do. We don't follow our hearts. My heart might well say, oh, I'm so happy my friend, my enemy lost his stuff. We don't follow our hearts. We follow our heads. And it's our heads that remember God's word. Return the property of your enemy, whether you like it or not. It makes you into a better person and it makes my society into a better society. It converts hatred into love. And love, by the way, is one of the words, one of the Hebrew words that we analyze in a wonderful book. And I, I, I don't mind saying it myself. This is a wonderful book that Susan and I created. The reason I don't mind saying it, it's, I'm not being arrogant or obnoxious because it's not our cleverness, it's God's. Uh, the book is called Life Lessons from the Lord's Language, where we allow... Buried Treasure, actually. Bur buried Treasure is the name <laughs> of the book. Uh, subtitle, Life Lessons from the Lord's Language. And um, it's, it's God's wisdom, where we allow His language to speak for itself. And so, for instance, we uh, have a section on the word love, the Hebrew word for love, explaining that love is not about what you want from the other person. It's about what you want to give to the other person. And we lay that out, how you can see it. By the way, this book is not for Hebrew readers. You don't have to know Hebrew, although you'll know a lot of Hebrew by the time you're done. But this is designed for people with no Hebrew background and people who want to be able to really get a handle on what God's plan for our lives really is. So um, easy way, a lovely way to do it is to support TCT ministry, which uh, as I, I think I've told you is something Susan and I actively do. Uh, we believe in it. We believe it's doing good in the world and uh, we value its, its, its ability to give us the chance to spend time together with you. So when you support TCT, one of the things you can do is ask whether acknowledgement of your gift could be a copy of business, excuse me, a copy of buried treasure, life lessons for the Lord's language, which TCT will be happy to, to let you have. It'll amaze you. It'll change your life. You'd love to have it. And I say change your life. I don't mean that lightly. It really does have the power to transform it's just writing the book did that for us and um, while I'm at it let me give you our website as well I know that you don't come to watch ancient Jewish wisdom without a pen and paper so write down rabbi Daniel and uh, and that way you'll uh, whenever you do want to visit our uh, our website where Susan and I are you can subscribe to our weekly thought tools uh, you can send a question to us. We have an Ask the Rabbi feature, which we love. And uh, we also have a place where you can shoot us an email, uh, tell us something, ask us something. Uh, you can also turn to a page which says when we're going to be in your neighborhood, when I'm going to be speaking at your church or your town, uh, or a way to invite us to come to your church. All of that at RabbiDanielLappin.com. We want you there. We want to have a chance to interact and see you there. And, uh, and so that brings us, unfortunately, very close to the end of, of today's show, which, uh, which Susan and I always greet with a mixture of, of, of jubilation and also sadness. Jubilation that we feel uplifted sharing this time with you because we, we, we have such a powerful sense of your presence there watching this show. It means the world to us and we, in turn, pray for your welfare in every way. Thank you for watching Ancient Jewish Wisdom with Rabbi Daniel Lappin.